have Lena Anderson today. Welcome to the Arthritis Life podcast again. Thank you so much for having me back. I must have done something right the first time. Yeah, I can't believe it was actually a year ago. It seems oh, like, it? It, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. But um, yeah, let's just, for those who didn't hear your wonderful episode about preparing for the holidays with chronic illness, um, can you give a little brief introduction of you and your JIA quote unquote story? Life story. My story. Yeah. I mean, well, it is, yeah, I got to do the, the really short version because it's been going on for a while. I uh, developed the first symptoms of juvenile idiopathic arthritis um, back in the days when it was called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And I was four years old, but didn't actually get diagnosed until I was nine. This was back in the, in what I not so fondly call the dark age of rheumatology. And uh, that means there was no treatment. Well, there was steroids, which is not great. There was gold injections and I couldn't tolerate them. And I think, and then there was aspirin for pain. It was even before the age of NSAIDs, uh, anti-inflammatory medication. And I still remember the first time I took this trial drug that, that nobody had heard of before. And, and the miracle that is an anti-inflammatory medication and that just treated the symptoms. So because there was no treatment, I spent a lot of time in hospitals and I actually ended up with like dual, like double hip replacements and a power wheelchair by the time I was 16. So I've been a wheelchair user for a very long time and I have, I'm one of the, you know, the old veterans kind of thing of um, people with RA and I do call myself someone with RA because my, the expression of my condition is very similar to RA, um, even though technically I'm considered an adult with JIA, but, but it was called juvenile, or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis because back then it, it was thought to just be the same condition, just juvenile, but they are actually different condition it's very confusing hi I have I a for a long yeah. time <laughs> so you know no and that's yeah that's part of our identities too though like what we call the you know our conditions is, is important yeah. so that's a that's a helpful distinction because I've had the mm -hmm. I've had the same question with people who had, were diagnosed as children with JIA or JRA and then are adults now who identify you know, who identify as having yeah. rheumatoid arthritis so yeah, that's super helpful. And yeah, for those who don't know, Lena mentioned she's in a power wheelchair. That's mm -hmm. electronic kind versus like yeah. you might see people like doing sports and stuff in the, in the, yeah, well, the, 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 the people who, if you can propel yourself uh, with your hands on the wheels, that's called a manual chair. Um, I can't do that. Thank you very much. All right. So I use a power wheelchair. I have a joystick and I, you know, and that, yeah. that drives me on everywhere. I should also mention that I live in Canada and Toronto and that I'm originally from Denmark. Right. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that, those are important, important tidbits. And so today we're going to talk about ableism. Um, what is your definition of ableism or how do you explain it to people who don't know? Um, I think it, it, when, what's interesting is becoming more known, but a lot of people still don't know what it is. And it's basically, the short version is, you know what racism is, this is the same, but against uh, disabled people. It's basically um, actions, words, or attitude that devalue and limit the potential of people with disabilities. That, that's very succinct. Yeah, and that's, I, I think that that's a helpful analogy to use the example of racism and say, okay, yeah, the things like, would you say the things that you say to a disabled person, would you say those things to someone of a of a minority racial group if you wouldn't it's probably mm -hmm. ableist <laughs> That's what you well like. and it, it's kind of I call it the d-test uh it's like because and we're going to dig into this in, in deeper because there isn't really an acknowledgement or an awareness that ableism exists people yeah. with disabilities and that affects people with chronic illness too even though you may not identify as disabled but we're asked to do, to suck up an awful lot of things. And so when I have the D-test, when somebody thinks, tells me I'm overreacting, I said, okay, so if that happens, say for instance, if access to a fancy hotel for women or for people who are racial, who come from a, um, 
BIPOC people, sorry, <laughs> it's the it's the terminology. I kind of went, no, racial minority is not the right word anymore. Right. So, sorry, I didn't I didn't say that wrong. Yeah. yeah, no, but I'm I'm like that's kind of where I've I've expressed it that way for a long time, but we have moved on to BIPOC. So right, right, right. So if somebody was BIPOC or a woman, if they were only allowed to go into a hotel through the back entrance, would that be a problem? And if you think it's a problem for another group, then guess what? It's a problem for somebody who is disabled as well. Yeah, I I think that's so true. And it can be so, there's a lot of like overt examples, like, you know, saying like, your life is less valuable because you use a wheelchair. Like that's an Mm -hmm. obvious one, but there's also so many subtle examples. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any like subtle or do you have any subtle ones that come to mind so that well that wasn't on our um, list, I just thought, yeah. I just thought well and it's it's like I mean Cheryl kindly sent me questions before and I kind of sat there and said okay there are so many I can't pick one uh, yeah. but I think I think something like let's talk about remote work because that's something a lot of people have done in the pandemic the ability to work remotely is something that many people in the disabled community has been asking for for you know decades and it's always been denied because no it's important that you're there and if you can't be there then you can't work here and then the pandemic happened and able-bodied people needed to work remotely and guess what it was instituted almost overnight and it's now to the point that i think a lot of people who are working or those who can work remotely are saying yeah like this is this is a must for any future work I do, which is hopefully why this opportunity will continue for people with disabilities, even though we are seeing it being walked back already. Now that we don't need it because it's going to kill people, then it's like, no, you must come in again. So ableism is alive and well. Yeah, no, that's so (coughs) true. Uh, the other one I think of is, and this came up really recently with a famous actor, Chris Pratt. He, um, mm. and it brought, came up that it's not just him. It's the idea that, and I had this a lot when I was pregnant, as long as it's healthy, you know, as long, and it's funny because like mm. my sister, my sister's a NICU nurse and she deals with babies that are extremely sick and sometimes that die and, and from health issues. And that is a horrible tragedy. No one No one wants their child to be very sick and no one wants their child to die. But when you say things like, as long as it's healthy, as if like, it's going to be a terrible thing if your child isn't a hundred percent perfectly healthy, it kind of feels as a person with a disability, like you're saying that my life is. Uh, I think it depends. And I, I, like everybody has a different perspective on this. And yes, there is. There is very much the perception that health is the ideal. And part of me wants to say, of course it is. Of course it is. But we also want to talk about why that is. And of course, but for those who don't know, what happened was that Chris Pratt recently, he's an actor. (laughs) Um, uh, If you're a a Jurassic Park fan, you know him. Uh, Or Jurassic World, rather. Um, He recently had a child and, and... sent out an Instagram message, I think, thanking his wife for bringing him, you know, for giving him a a healthy, beautiful child. And aside from the sexism inherent in, you know, the woman giving him a child, what people took issue with was the fact that he also has a child with a previous, from a previous relationship, who does live with some form of disability. I don't know what it is. And I think that's what people especially remarked on. And and part of me said, it's like, it's the normal joy of any new parent and saying healthy kid, because that is what we all want, because no, no parent wants their child to go through the extra difficulties of having an illness or, or disability. And I think it's okay to be grateful for that. As long as you are aware that, you know, disability is the one thing that can um, affect anyone at any time. But I think it was the part where he he said that had already having being the father of a disabled child that made people really upset. And I, and I got it. And part of me kind of went, eh, he's just a happy new dad who said something and didn't think about it. And the other part of me went, you know, dude, you're, you're, you live in the public eye. So maybe be careful. 
Yeah. Yeah. There, I think the context is everything. Like you said, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being happy that you had a healthy child, but if you also, like you mentioned, have a child yeah. with a disability that was, and was born premature. And uh, yeah. yeah, again, anyone who's had a premature child or a child with a health condition doesn't take health for granted anymore, but at the same time, yeah, it was an interesting situation, but it's a part of a larger context of this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, um, health being the default, you know, the norm, the it's norm. normal. Like right. you wouldn't you say have a normal child. Right? You wouldn't say like, as long as my baby's white, like <laughs> that would just be awful. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing I didn't prepare you for this, so sorry, but it just came back to my mind is, you know, in, in the same way that associated with, you know, the word racism is the idea of privilege. Like privilege doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong, it, but be, but you have to be aware of your privilege. And I think mm -hmm. something that I have really started noticing is the idea of health privilege that, you know, mm -hmm. people who are, you know, hundred percent able-bodied, however you choose to measure that, you know, they do have a degree of, of privilege over people yeah. who have health conditions. And there's this interesting line that can be drawn because sometimes people do take actions in their life, like exercise or following a certain diet that help their health. But th so the step one is like, okay, acknowledging that like I go running, like I used to run every day and I ate healthy and then I got rheumatoid arthritis, but someone else who runs and mm -hmm. is health and eats healthily is thinking to themselves, well, the fact that I do these things is the reason that I I'm not ever, well, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, and there is an interesting, actually, I'm, I'm reading a really interesting book right now called uh, Quarantine Life, and I can't remember the author, but look it up. It's wonderful. Um, and the author talks a lot about how like, the expectations of getting people to all of a sudden act for the community where, and I'm going to pick on your country for a moment, but the U.S. is founded on individual grit. And the concept that if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, anyone has the possibility to make it. And that has translated into health in the sense that, that you have an individual responsibility for health, which I think, and, and there's this whole idea that if you just, you said, eat right and exercise and do the right thing, you're protected, except you're not. But I think that it, it's, it was a very interesting point that sort of made me go, oh, I think I understand better now that when you then enter a pandemic where the, the individual, each individual for their own is responsible for their own health to then expect people who have grown up in that culture to then see that now they're responsible for other people's health. So it was kind of an interesting concept, but yes, like we, we do have this whole idea that and it's not isolated to, to the U.S., of course, but we have an idea that we take our bodies for granted. We take our, our ability to keep going for granted because most of the time we're not aware of all the work that goes into keep doing whatever you want until all of a sudden you can't, whether you get the flu or you get and more often a chronic illness, then all of a sudden you become aware of, wait, and bodies are magic. No. And it's like, it's happened a lot with, with the pandemic. I mean, if, if anything, the pandemic should make everyone confront the fact that, you know, none of your health promoting behaviors are hundred percent guaranteed. Right. But, um, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you know, this person, they were, you know, a, a 30 year old weightlifter and they got mm -hmm. COVID and now they have severe post COVID syndrome or they died. And everyone's like mm -hmm. shocked. Cause they're like, wait, it challenges their worldview to realize that, nothing protects you sometimes or well, not, and, nothing is guaranteed to protect and, you. Well, and I think there's a, there's a psychological term called cognitive dissonance that says in the face of when people continue to believe something in the face of proof otherwise, people still go, well, that happened to me, but it won't happen. That, that happens with that person. It won't happen to me. Um, so it, it just persists. Like it's, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around when you are so used to and I think seeing and feeling obvious proof that if you eat well and you exercise, you get stronger and feel better. And that, that, that counts for most people. Like even when you have a chronic illness, if you have the means and ability to eat healthy, you're likely to feel a bit better, but maybe not all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to circle back. I forgot to clarify this earlier, but for those 
who might not have known what you were talking about when you said the D tax, you meant like D, the D test, test, the D oh, test, D-test, the disability test. test. Sorry. Yes. I thought you were saying tax, like you no, were taxed test. for having a disability test. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the D test earlier. That, yeah. That's why I call it because I am unimaginative. I'm, I'm sure I could get a better, te- a, a better really? name for it, but the D stands for both disability and discrimination. Oh, so it's a double D, okay. but that sounds vaguely sexual. So that's not the DD test. And, yeah. uh, um, well, so that's so helpful. No, and the other thing I wanted to do really quickly is read the definition of ableism from a really great website. I'm going to put in the show notes called stopableism.org, but they define ableism as a set of practices and beliefs that assign inferior value or worth to people who have developmental, emotional, mm-hmm. physical, or psychiatric disabilities. And furthermore, I thought this part was really interesting. An ableist society is said to be one that treats non-disabled individuals as the standard of normal Mm -hmm. living, which results in public and private places and services, education and social work that are built to serve standard people, Mm -hmm. thereby inherently excluding those with various disabilities, end quote. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a helpful uh, definition. Again, because it's not something that we end up, you know, Fortunately, nowadays we do learn about, you know, ableism, or, you know, racism in school. Hopefully, hopefully actually not. Well, depending everyone. on Sorry. what state you're I'm in. I'm in a very liberal, I grew up in a very liberal <laughs> suburb of Seattle, yeah. but no, it's true. Not everyone does. Um, but, you know, people might have heard it more frequently than, than ableism. So I, yeah. Was there anything well, there? and I, and I, and I think it, it also speaks to the, the fact that that just like racism, and we have had uh, a really intense education in racism in the, over the last two years, and it's a welcome one because I think it pushed a lot of people further down the road to, to being more equitable. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that, as that definition you just read out talks about, it's, it's systemic ableism. It is built into, like ableism is built into every structure in our world and legislation to create equality for disability or create accessibility is really welcome (laughs) but often a band-aid because like you can't fix a systemic practice you can begin to fix it but you need much more like when when the norm is ability then anything you do for accessibility and inclusivity for then becomes automatically seen as sort of special. And I think the goal in fighting ableism is to integrate accessibility and make it the norm, which yeah. is a big task. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the other thing that has come up a lot over the last year and a half of I, as I've um, done my support groups for people with uh, rheumatic diseases is internalized ableism mm-hmm. that when you have, especially when you're recently diagnosed, but even in waves, you know, many years after confronting what your own internalized beliefs that you've developed over time that, you know, again, mm-hmm. yeah, like health being healthy is the norm or the desired, again, it is desired to be mm-hmm. healthy, but that I'm worse because I have a health condition. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, do you have any thoughts about how people can confront their own internalized ableism or how you, um, to how start you to dismantle it, dismantled it. Yes. yes. I was just like such a good word. Um, I think it's like one of the, one of the, the most obvious signs well there's there's two when i think about it of internalized ableism and also externalized stigma is i know a lot of women who have joint changes in their hands and are ashamed of that and will hide their hands or stop wearing nail polish or stop wearing rings as not bring attention to the hands that right there that's internalized ableism that if your hands look different, like I'm a big fan. Um, and I don't know if it's because I had, like, I prefer the word joint changes to deformities, by the way. Um, Me too. So, yeah, <laughs> deformities is icky. Um, that's that's another D word I don't, I don't like. But it's like, I've had, as you can see my, I don't know if you can see it for the blur, but I've had joint changes since I was very young. And it has never stopped me from wearing rings or putting on funky nail color or, and and I think it's, I, I don't know what, maybe it was because it happened when I was young. Uh, but I think when all of a sudden your fingers go from looking 
quote unquote normal to not, then then it's like, yes, by all means be upset that you have visible signs of your illness. But on the other hand, be ashamed of that. Like shame is a sign that you've done something right. Well, no, guilt is a sign that you've done something wrong. Shame is a sign that you feel that you are wrong. There's nothing wrong with anything, <laughs> you know? You're not hurting and like it, 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 this is this is a condition that you can't control with the powers of your mind. And there is real empowerment in wearing that funky ring or painting your nails blue for, you know, I do that for Arthritis Awareness Month. And it, it, so that's a big thing. But I think the internalized and, and another big role in the internalized ableism forest is the association with of worth with productivity. And we're seeing it being challenged quite a lot in, I think, especially, and I'm going to sound so old now, the younger generation, like the, what's the one after millennials? Generation because, Z. I think so. X, no, no, yeah, there's X Z, and millennials yeah. and Z. Well, see, I'm in, in Canada, so I would say Generation Z, but Z, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we mean the same thing. But I think for a while, hustle culture was so much of it. it like, hustle culture was just like you had to have a full time job and you had to have a side hustle and you had to do this. And I love that the next generation is coming up and saying, in reaction to that and saying, no, my worst is not my productivity. So you might see a lot of conversation about uh, capitalism and productivity. And yes, it is very much linked to the, our economic model. But this whole sense of that you are only worth something if your products have. Um, and it's something I'm struggling a lot with because I think there's a line somewhere. I like getting stuff done. And some of that is because I like getting stuff done because I have always moved fast. But some of that is because I feel like I only have worth and value if I get stuff done. And starting to kind of question that in yourself, like this, dismantling that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of thinking. There's another book that is on my to read list that's called There's No Such Thing as Lazy, The Laziness Lie. I'll let you know and, and so you can link it. I can't remember the title exactly that I haven't read yet, but I really want to start dismantling that. And it's the exact same thing as learning how to dismantle your systemic racism as you start reading about it, you start questioning. Um, you put that funky nail polish on and you give yourself permission to rest and you start saying, like, I think the overdue, you know, the overdue and crash cycle that so many people with chronic illness have, that's an expression of internalized ableism. Aside from the fact that there's stuff you need to get done, but the that's one thing because we all have the administrative life, but then there is the impulse to get it all one day done in one day when you know you can't and when you know it'll lead to a crash. Slowing down and telling people is like, no, I can't meet that deadline or no, I'm not available. It kind of takes back control of your life and allows you to gives yourself permission to live your life the, the way you need to do when you have a partner that is chronic illness. And it may not be quote unquote normal, or it may not be on the speed of what everybody else expects, which by the way, has increased since the internet. We now yes. want everything yeah. now. Whereas mm -hmm. I still remember working back in the day pre-internet and intranet in a, in a, in an office where, you know, if you had a memo, you put it in an envelope and it got sent out and someone would get it the next day and then it would take a while to get back to you. It's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. The world will not end. No. So I think those are some of the ways you can start kind of challenging your own panic, I guess, yes. because yes. it feels like a panic when... And it feels like the shame, the worthlessness, the everything, if you don't get the dishes done today, but is the world really going to end? And that, that sort of helps me a little. Yeah. And, and you mentioned like mobility aids, which is, uh, or you mentioned like not wanting to use, you know, and not wanting to do anything that ha is a physical manifestation of your, what's often for people diagnosed recently, more a hidden, hidden mm -hmm. disease for 
uh, who people who don't have the joint changes yet. Um, and I think that that's one that's come up a lot. People saying, I know that I need, let's say going, I mean, this is, this is a little bit out of date, but going to Disneyland, I mean, some people are still going to Disneyland, but you know, going somewhere public and knowing that you need a motorized scooter, even if you're not a power wheelchair user typically, but when you have long distances you need to cover, it's just not sustainable for some mm -hmm. people to have the endurance, but they'll say, well, I don't want to have to use that. And I think, I think it's complex. It's not just internalized ableism. I think there's also a lot of people that fall into this like donut hole, like the middle of the donut hole where it's like, I'm not fully able-bodied and I'm not fully disabled. Mm -hmm. And like somewhere in that like messy middle where I maybe, maybe if I just tried harder, I could walk all the way around Disney, like, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. But in, whether it's, you know, using, like, I've gotten all these comments, um, thinking about just general aids for daily living, you know, as an occupational therapist, I'm very like pragmatic about them. I don't mm. feel shame. <laughs> That's kind of my problem actually, it's my <laughs> blessing and a curse. but no, I don't feel a lot of shame with them. Like I'm yeah. like, this is great. I get to use this cool jar opener, but I've known that's unusual. A lot of people do feel shame or they go through a stage where they feel shame. I don't want to have to, you know, I'm only 20. I don't want to have to be like, quote unquote, the grandma. Well, that's ageism already saying it's worse to be a grandma. That's a lot of isms. Yeah, a lot of isms, but you know, saying, oh, I don't want to have to use this, you know, and learning that, oh, the world keeps turning, you know, if I, if I use these and I feel better if I use them. So, um, and the other one you said is that I, or you started talking about is this idea that like, I, my life is over. Like when I get this diagnosis, my life is over particularly if I don't cure or heal it. And that's, and I mentioned this like practically every episode, but it's a trap that so many newly diagnosed people fall into of like, okay, well, I got diagnosed with this bad thing. And I mean, again, I don't wish the diagnosis on anyone. If I had a choice whether or not to have it, I would obviously choose not to, but it doesn't mean my life is over. And it doesn't mean that if I must cure or heal it at all costs, otherwise, my life is meaningless. And that's a really dangerous road to go down. There are people who've been able to take actions that they feel in, in their experience have resulted in them, you know, maybe not needing medication or something like that. But that doesn't mean that the people who need to take the medicines or don't feel a hundred percent all the time that they're what, that their life is like totally pointless. So anyway, and the third one I wanted to mention is one actually, and I'll, I'll just be honest because I'm very like, um, upfront with people, you know, I didn't actually call him out on this episode because I only had like 35 minutes with him, but Dr. Micah, you very casually, he's a, he's a um, rheumatologist and also does a lot of integrative medicine and integrative health. And these ableist things are very predominant in, in those spaces at times. And he said, well, no one wants to be on medication. And I, I wanted to say, well, actually, yeah, I do because I know like, you know, what it I, I imagine what it was like like you were mentioning earlier to circle back to your introduction what it was like before there were any effective medications like medications are why i'm able to and well to to, to, to like to be quite honest i don't want to take medication yeah. but i know what my life is like without it like if, if i had a magic wand i would love to be to not be sick but i think yeah. the pragmatism is important because it's like of course, I don't want to take medication, but if nothing else helps, guess what? Yeah, it makes me it, it, it is a tool. I think there's it's again like the Chris Pratt conversation. I think it's mm. dual sided because, yes, I would prefer not to have all the weird side effects because I'm a side effect magnet. But I also remember what my life, my life was like before I had a medication that works and I like to call myself the base the worst case scenario case scenario of RA because the worst case scenario because I am sort of the example of what very severe disease does to people um, without treatment um, but at the same time I'm the example of what finding a medication can that works can do it will not undo the damage but I live my life now, right? And I see as a miracle because I, I spent most of my life without meds and finding something that takes away that level of suffering is mind boggling still to me. Yeah. But I also think that, and this reminded me of, of uh, this whole, nobody wants to take medication and, and seeing the med meds as a tool. And it has to be a tool that works. Like if it, it's a tool that 
makes you feel just as bad as you did without it, then you need another tool. But also mobility aids or doodads. Like I said, you're the queen of the doodads. Um, It's a tool. And you use tools all the time to do things better. You use a car so you don't have to walk 40 miles to work every day. And for me, something like a mobility, let's take a wheelchair, let's go all the way there. I have no idea how many times I've heard it in my life. It's like, oh, you know, like you're so inspiring. I'd rather kill myself than lose the, do, lose the use of my legs. Yeah, people have said it to me um, or words to that effect. And number one, like I always kind of say, like that just shows a lack of imagination. If you can only imagine your life walking, then you're the one with the problem. But and, and there's a systemic issue to that too. But I, I think believe they would tools. say that to your face. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm like, yeah. No, why no. am I still surprised? I still get surprised. Ableism, my friends, ableism. Uh, um, but I also think that we can go down the rabbit hole of inspiration porn and how that yeah. feeds that oh, whole, what? oh my God, you got out of bed, you're still breathing. But let me, Wait, I'm going to finish uh, the tool. Um, I think one of the things that's problematic with a wheelchair, and I see a lot of people, both in terms of they don't want to be a wheelchair user, and we'll get to why that happened, like why people have that feeling in a second um but you also see doctors like i've talked to people where their doctors will not authorize the wheelchair because they want them to keep going and i'm like oh you're kidding me because a wheelchair is a tool that helps you conserve energy reduce pain and live your life so if to your point about going to disneyland or going to the mall where there's a lot of walking if you could have that experience without being exhausted and in the kind of pain that requires you to rest for two weeks afterwards, can you imagine how much left energy you would have left to have fun or to live your life or do go shopping on your own or whatever. Like I am, I'm, I'm lucky I found an apartment in downtown Toronto. So in, in a fairly accessible area. So I, I can do almost all of it myself. I can get out there. I do my own grocery shopping. I, you know, I go for walks in the neighborhood and all of that. And that's not something I would be able to do with my wheelchair. And then we get to the terminology about wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair. No way. I'm liberated by my wheelchair. Without it, I'd be confined to bed. And I think once you start seeing it, this, this is a tool that saves me energy reduces pain whatever it does so you can do the life part of life with a disability life with a chronic illness and just kind of switching that but it is dismantling your the ableism which brings me to my next part I should probably let you participate in this oh my gosh no I went on the longest rant right before this so no keep going this is your answer I was just going to ask that because as you said I I so often hear people tell me that that the thing that convinced them to try biologic medications, for example, was that their doctor mm-hmm. said, well, if you don't take these, you might end up in a wheelchair, like cue the music, dun, 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 like, <laughs> you know, like, and again, I mean, I, it's not saying that life is easier in a wheelchair than it is without one, to, unless you're, it, there's, there's multiple ups and downs of, of both, but the point is, I wondered how it felt to you to hear those things in the community, like, oh. Well, I, I think, like, on some level, again, there's always, sometimes I hate being the kind of person who can see the shades of gray and everything. But, oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, story of my life, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, like, it's a short form for saying, if you don't take try this medication, you will have... irreversible damage that will severely limit your life and your ability to live it that's true but a wheelchair being used as a you know uh, as the big bad or the bugaboo or the you know the monster is like there's two there's two layers to this there is there is the and, and really people don't want to of course like if I could walk of course I would rather walk like, let's not get, let's, let's, like, I am fine being disabled. I have been disabled for a long time. This is not a problem to me. But what makes it a problem is, um, and the wonderful Stella Young, an Australian disability advocate who is 
now no longer alive, sadly, because she was awesome. She did a TED Talk that you should all watch. Um, but she talked about the social definition of disability, where that I have a disability because the environment around me is not accessible, because it has barriers. If there were no barriers around me, I would not have the same level of disability. So it's a function of how inaccessible and how ableist society is, because accessibility is not the norm. You still have to ask for it constantly. And people can say no. Like it becomes something you have to beg for, and which is wrong. When all human rights legislation says that you have a right to equal treatment, it's the implementation that's a safety. So of course you don't want to end up in a wheelchair because it sucks. And not because of the no walking thing, but because the world and the people around you are geared to discriminate you against you. Yeah, you you describe I mean that makes perfect sense to me. And the other thing, little nuance that that I've noticed is um uh, in my spinal cord rehabilitation internship. Um, this is going to relate, I promise, but spinal cord rehab usually is a lot of it is training people on how to, you know, which is fitting them for an appropriate wheelchair training on daily tasks, like getting, you know, getting closed on when you are paralyzed, which is a different situation. Paralyzed being paralyzed is different than, um, rheumatoid arthritis. But the point of this was that we, I'm trying to figure out how to say this shorter. There are different <laughs> kinds of spinal cord injuries. The one that you people think of as the kind of the extreme case is a complete spinal cord like transaction where you don't have any sensation or feeling at the level below the injury. So like you can't, let's say you might be able to move your trunk and your arms completely, but you can't move your legs and you're in a wheelchair, but you're pr propelling it and you're able to completely live in paraplegic. You're, you're, yeah. you're saying paraplegic. Yeah, paraplegic, exactly. So there were also, there are also though injuries that are actually like own partial. And one of them is like called central cord syndrome. And what it is, is you, it actually is the opposite of being, um, it, it, it being paraplegic. It is where you can't use your hands and your arms very well, but you can walk and ever in general for daily life function, people's default assumption is if I, if I didn't, if my hands didn't work very well, oh, well, but I can still walk. But if I couldn't walk, everything would suck. And in, if you, I'm saying just from my observation, doesn't mean, I don't want to minimize anyone's lived experience. If your lived experience is different, that's different for you. But in general, because our hands are so important for function, I would say personally, after witnessing these kind of injuries, I would rather have complete paralysis in my legs than lose the function of my hands. And because, and, I, and that's just, so people have these assumptions. Again, if I couldn't walk, everything would be over. It's actually much more complicated than that. Does that make well, sense? Well, it always is. But I also think that, that we are encouraged to compare ourselves. Like how many times have you talked to somebody who says, oh, well, uh, there are other people who have it worse than me. So therefore I shouldn't complain. And I'm not a big fan of that because first of all, like comparing it, uh, it either lifts you up against somebody else's misery, but it also pushes other people down. But more than that, it's all about the context of your life. Mm -hmm. Because if you used to be, if you used to run every day and you used to swing dance, as I know you did, and you then can't do that, or if you can't wash the bathtub anymore, that's important. You have a right to be upset about that, but you also have a right to ask for help in some way. Um, and I think yeah, that, yeah. that that's another ableist issue is that it's seen as, seen as shameful to ask for help. Yet when you look at how many of us spend at least part of our life helping others and sort of enjoying whether it's, it's, it's volunteerism or advocacy or helping a neighbor who just had a, had a child or whatever, right? Like we, People like to help because it makes them feel like they are actually making an impact. So, but the minute you get, the minute you need the help, you have trouble asking for it. So it's kind of, it's, it's weird, right? So, yeah. so I, I generally tend to say, it's like, well, there might be some, for some people walking, walking is the most important thing for other people is the ability to use the hands. No, um, I'm not going to tell you, I, I will tell you, I've gotten used to things I never thought I'd be used to. 
Um, the human, the human, human beings are hardwired to adapt. And I think don't underestimate your own ability to create a beautiful life in and around whatever your limitation is. That's like, I want that on my bumper sticker. I love it. Like in a positive way. I mean, that is, I realize people use, I didn't realize for a long time people use that phrase as like, oh, well, that's just a bumper sticker phrase. I'm like, no, bumper sticker phrases are good. <laughs> like they're what yeah. you remember. Yeah. yeah, and that's so true. And I, I know you're really, you're thinking like an OT, I would say, and I think that that's because you have the lived experience in, in many ways, but like- well, And, they, and I was trained as a social worker, so you know. Okay, that's, yeah, exactly. It's like, the, you're right that the context is everything. The, and I, I don't, again, I really don't want to feed into like, there can definitely be the disability Olympics. Like, and I've got oh, comments yeah. like, you must not have RA that bad because you're dancing yeah. or you must not have. And I was like, well, yeah, like I'm on the continuum somewhere. I'm not like the person in the world who has it like objectively the worst. And I'm not the person in the world who has it objectively the best, but I don't no, want to play into that. No, I think, and, I th and I think we just need to stop judging each other and ourselves yeah. all the time and having to feel we have to justify our membership in whatever club. Like if you have a diagnosis, guess what? You're in the club. I don't care. Like I know somebody who has been the lucky person who's not severely affected and runs and exercises and all of that. She still belongs in the club because she has the diagnosis. Yeah. And like it, it is, like you said, it's a, it's a continuum. We are moving towards a world where autoimmune arthritis is increasingly invisible, which is, I never thought I'd get here. I, I did not think this would happen in my lifetime. And the fact that it has, I think is such a hopeful thing. But it comes with a price because I, say, I like to say that there are real benefits to having an invisible illness. But there are also real benefits to having a visible illness because nobody questions my need for access. They may not give it to me, but they don't question it. They don't question the fact that I have RA. Like you look at my fingers, I have RA. I use a wheelchair. It's obvious. And, it, and, and, and being obviously disabled comes with a whole, sorry, crap load. Of, That's okay. Um, I, I always say that, that, that there may be swearing on this, on, or in yeah. the... Um, and when I upload it, I always put it under explicit because I can't remember whether we swore or not. <laughs> so, <you can> swear. <laughs> um, but there's a, a ton of stigma and discrimination. But on the other hand, when you have an invisible illness, you can pass, quote unquote. But it means that you have to, that people don't believe you when you need an accommodation um, or to work remotely or to, you know, whatever. Like you have a harder time justifying your... Yes your requirements and and I just I would much rather live in, live in a world where if somebody says yeah I have a disability and I need this that you then don't have to prove it and technically in human rights legislation you you shouldn't have it's enough to self-identify but that's another thing but it, it, it's like I do understand at present like they, of course people don't want to identify as disabled or come out as, and say they're disabled or be visibly disabled because we, community, we live in a culture that is so ableist that it doesn't consider ableism ableism is the norm yeah and and these days you have you bet you have some some luck in in calling out racism or transphobia or homophobia or sexism but ableism, people will argue that it doesn't exist. So yeah. um, that's how ableist we are. And that's how early in this fight we are. I hope we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> to a point where this is a word that people actually know. Mm -hmm. And the more and the more able-bodied or seemingly able-bodied allies we have, the better. Yeah. No, that's so, so helpful. And I think it, it comes back to the idea of privilege, like with the invisible mm -hmm. versus visible disability it's like there are privileges for me that I'm like able body passing you know and there are unprivileges you yeah. know what are those called disadvantages for sure and I think I just want to I don't know if I'm even going to keep this in the podcast but I, I just want to make sure I clarify when I was talking about the spinal cord injuries that affect your hands more than your feet I wasn't trying to say I, I wanted to try to 
to have people challenge this notion yeah. that yeah, no. having a wheelchair period would be the yeah. worst case. And it, it doesn't, there's a lot more complex. And I know, you know that, but just for the people listening, what it, and, and it, yeah, no. And I, and, and I am aware that, that I'm aware of how you meant it, but I think it, it, it was a good segue for the comparison or the, the disability no. Olympics, as you said, because it's like, some people would say, oh yeah, and I might be like this. It, it's like the question, would you rather you, you lose your sight or your hearing? And it's like, can we not play this game? Can, yeah. can we please? Can we please? Yeah. Because it completely depends on you. If you are an artist, or like a painter or a potter or anything like that, then losing your hands would be awful. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But you can do some of that from a seated position. Mm -hmm. If you are, if you make your living as an athlete, yeah. then or like an athlete like a soccer player say uh yeah. which is all which about is kind of you funny can't touch that, the ball yeah I could still when my hands aren't doing well for for I, I now I have a, a neck injury where I, I, I will not be playing soccer for probably the rest of my life like actual playing playing soccer um like uh but yeah I I, I could still do soccer Ooh. it's like the one sport sorry yeah yeah uh, no and it's like it, it all depends on you but even then to my point, it, it's that we are, we have super powers in, a, in adapting as yes. human beings. This is how we survived as a breed, not a breed, that's for cats. Uh, yeah. It's species. how we survive yeah. species. Yes, that's the one. It's how we survived as a species. We adapted and, and like it really is, you can adapt to anything, almost anything, let's say almost anything and yeah. just give yourself some time and some resources. And I think that's the important feature. I watched, uh, there's a movie called, oh, what is the movie called? It's an older movie with Javier Bardem playing. The Sea Inside? That's the one. We are soul sisters. Like that's one of my favorite are. movies. Oh, oh. well, well, see. <laughs> so I'm a big fan. To criticize. Of this. It's my favorite movie to criticize. No, I'm just oh, I do like well, it. both yes and no. Like on yeah. one hand, I'm a big fan of like, let, let's go to, let's go to assisted, uh, assisted suicide, shall we? Why not? And you okay, can keep yeah. it or not. Like, um, I'll just put a trigger. But I think like, I so the scene side is about a Spanish fisherman who, uh, was in an accident, broken his neck, became a quadriplegic, and spent the next 20 years lying on the third floor of a farmhouse in bed, um, and became a poet. I, I haven't read I haven't read any of his poetry because I don't know if it's translated, so I may have to learn Spanish just to read it. But and he spent most of those years fighting for the right to have helped to kill himself because he was paralyzed from the neck down so he couldn't do it. And I watched the movie and it's beautiful. And I'm a big fan of people being in charge of what they can and cannot cope with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I remember looking at that movie and thinking, well, maybe if he'd gotten an accessible apartment, the right kind of wheelchair and some attendant care in a city that wasn't hopelessly inaccessible, maybe he wouldn't have wanted to kill himself no I, yes i thought the same thing too yeah i mm. i i if there was another one me before you which i i despise mm. that book and movie i absolutely despise it because yeah it was very un inaccurate to the ways that it's actually possible to live I, i'm just mesmerized by heart I, I think i'm i'm mesmerized by javier bardem and like anything he does oh well so, yeah who isn't i think who i'm isn't? totally biased but <laughs> yes, yeah no, no that's i will i will watch it read the phone book um, yeah yeah no but me before you see this is also interesting because i quite like the book because I thought the book did a pretty good job of saying, like, it is the same old story. If somebody gets paralyzed and they kill themselves because life is not worth living. But I think it did a pretty good job of showing how the main character, she did a lot of research. She talked to other people who, was, mm -hmm. who had spinal cord injuries. Um, she, tr she got them to talk to this character and say, like, listen, you can have a good life. And he went, I know you can, but I don't feel I can. So I think the book mm -hmm. did a better job. It was yeah, still, yeah. you know, the standard, somebody's um, enlightenment uh, by being around a disabled person who kills themselves. Like yeah. the million, million dollar baby I will rant about for hours.
Oh, I never saw movie. that one. Oh, don't, don't. You will be so mad. Oh, no. Um, it, it's, it's again, the, the disabled person choosing death rather than disability is a vehicle for somebody else's <sighs> journey, and it's just nauseating. But it's on me, me before you. The book did a, pretty, a much better job. Yeah, it, but I, I think didn't the watch movie I, I was should... terrible. You know, I should say, actually, I couldn't bring myself to watch the movie. I just hate the concept yeah. of the movie. So I didn't, but I read the book yeah. and I didn't like it. Um, mm. But, but you're, you're right that it did, it was more nuanced than it sounded like it yes. would be if you read the description of the book. But, but it's, the, it's still the same old trope. It's that disabled people are only part of movies or books if, if they can be a pathetic vi- victim, if they can choose death over disabled life yeah. or if the disability is an outward representation of an inner evil those yeah. are the three things that we get to play and usually it's you know it's inspiration porn all over again <laughs> and yes. and it's offensive did you read carol silverstein's book um the, uh, she, I had her on the podcast. Um, it's a young adult novel. Kurt. Um, I've heard of it. It's really on my good. list. Yeah, it's really no, good because she and she says it right up front. Like, or actually, no, sorry, in the epilogue, she says it right in the end. Like, no, but throughout the whole thing is that you know she did not want to write the disability inspiration story, <laughs> especially for young adult and teenagers. That's not how she. It's based on her life experience. It's a mem- mm. it, or it's not a memoir. It's a fiction but based mm-hmm. on her experience yeah. she's like you know I got diagnosed with JRA and I felt like annoyed and frustrated and I didn't listen to my doctors and like I did a lot of stuff that like 14 year olds do like I wasn't like okay I'm going to go be the model like the same way as like a model minority you don't want to be like yeah. the, you know all these representations of like you know oh this person was like the model disabled person you know like so and so is in a wheelchair but they don't let anything stop them. <laughs> oh my God. That whole, oh, they don't. Oh, 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 they, they, I don't let anything stop them. Oh, Do you not, yeah, yeah. And I guess what? Guess what? Maybe if you put in some stairs, it wouldn't stop. No, the opposite of stairs. Maybe you didn't put in so many damn stairs. It wouldn't stop me. Yeah. But when my entire environment is built as a barrier, you get, guess what? It does stop me. And, and rheumatoid arthritis does stop me. Yeah. And sometimes what it does instead is change how I do things. Mm -hmm. But then, and we're back to ableism because I need to do things like this, but the world will only let me do it like this. And like, like remote work again is a pretty brilliant metaphor for the whole thing. Yeah. Because if I need to work from home, so I don't arrive at work exhausted after the commute. Guess what? You'll get a better, you'll get better work out of me. But it, the whole insistence on FaceTime just. Mm. Well, and Anyways. then there's the there's the one where it's um this is really hard for having a dynamic disability. So who people who haven't heard this yeah. phrase, dynamic disability is a disability that where symptoms fluctuate over time. So or a, in a daily hourly basis, like I might be in a horrible flare on Saturday. And then be feeling great on Monday morning and then terrible again, Monday afternoon. Like, so, but the, in the culture, we don't have a good framework for understanding that. So people will say, well, you could do that yesterday. You could do, why can't you do it today? And that's what employers are famous for doing that to deny people accommodations. Or even I used to work in the schools and they would say things like, well, Timmy could do it yesterday. And I was like, well, great. Yeah. And like you said, context is everything too. Yeah. Well, you, today's not yesterday. It's a different day, a <laughs> different context. Well, but it's like, well, but even even able-bodied, healthy people aren't the same from day to day. Right. Right. You know, and and it's, but I think it's this whole insistence on, and I think we're getting back to capitalism, where it's the you are supposed to produce like a machine day after day after day, even as a child, apparently, and. And nobody's like that. No person is like that because you may, go, may wake up with bad allergies or you may wake up and, and your child is sick or, you know, your car breaks down or whatever. And if you do, if you have making the world accessible to people with disabilities will make it a more flexible and better place for everyone. Because as we have seen the remote work, and I keep harping on that because it's so perfect, 
remote work that we have asked for that we have needed so so much and haven't gotten, which is why there's such high unemployment rates. It's one of the factors. Look, it benefits everyone. Everyone likes it. Well, not everyone likes it, but the people who don't need to be on site to do something, like let's take a look at what is the job, what what is the task you need done, <laughs> and how do you do it most effectively? Yeah, and that's often not being in an office. So, and it's it's just so egregious that after everyone has been shown over the course of mm-hmm. a year or longer that people can still do their jobs remotely. They're still not being given that accommodation. Well, they're still being, like we're going back to the whole, no, you need to be in the office. Well, I don't know you survive as a, if a business aligned with its workforce at home, uh, working remotely and maybe even thrived. Yeah. Why? But I think it is, I had a, I had a thought and I, I forget where I was oh, going. Oh no, I'm sorry. It. I think I interrupted your train of thought. No, and <laughs> I think it's like, it's a concept behind universal design. Mm, universal mm-hmm. design is different than accessibility. Accessibility kind of puts it in the, you know, the special place for a special mm. things for a special population. If you design per universal accessibility, which is as many people as possible can use it, it benefits something that if you're looking at doors that open automatically, like not like yeah. a door yeah. opener is a great thing, but even doors that just open and more and more are doing it, especially after the pandemic is let's yeah. get people into a building without touching anything. Yeah, that helps that people who are carrying packages. It helps people who broke their legs skiing. It helps Parents with strollers, all of you out there who have had a who have had a stroller, know how useful accessibility is. Yeah, it helps so many. It provides more efficient and easier access for many more people, and and better use of it. So, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we could no, keep going. This is so good. No, this is so good. Yeah, I know we do unfortunately need to wrap up, but well, you might be my first three Pete, the first person. There's a couple <laughs> that have come on twice. So now you're uh, now you might be the first one to have to come on three times. <laughs> um, do, I get it, do I get a medal or something? Oh yeah. <laughs> I should start giving out badges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but is there anything else you wanted to let the audience know about ableism or what it's like to be a wheelchair user with rheumatoid arthritis or anything else? Any rants? I think no, I think I'm out. I'm ranted out for today. Okay. <laughs> uh, either that I'm so hungry uh, for lunch oh. that that it's it has more of an impact. I think my overall message would be that if you don't need If you don't need accessibility, ask for it anyway, because for instance, think of it this way, like if a store had a sign out that said uh, that you can't, like people who, uh, BIPOC people or women can't come in here, you would not frequent that. So I think demanding accessibility, not only asking for it, but demanding it when more and more people say, is this accessible? Do you have stairs? Can we check it around? Do you have an accessible washroom? And you'd be surprised how many restaurants, for instance, will say, yeah, we're accessible, but the washroom is in the basement. No. Um, I think my point is the more people who ask for it is important. I'm not encouraging you to engage in cancel culture because our infrastructure is not yet built to that, but there's such a thing as portable ramps. If you only have a couple of steps up, um, ask for it, start mentioning it, saying things like, how do you serve people with disabilities? Does anyone know American Sign Language? Um, that pin pad doesn't work <laughs> or it's too high, etc. The more people who say it, the more people in business and industry, et cetera, and in government, understand that it's a priority. That's... And, and I think unless people with disabilities are a very powerless group, partly because we're busy managing our, our health conditions, but also because, well, this is a subject for another day, but, but if you are relying on social assistance, that keeps you poor and downtrodden. Mm-hmm. But the more the world understands that this is not a niche topic, that just as you're demanding the dismantling on racist systems that you're also just requiring the world to be more to to be less ableist then something will happen then it then we will move from a place where nobody knows what ableism is 
to one where people say, yes, of course, this is accessible. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. Thank you so, so much. I can't wait to share this with Thank everyone. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And if anyone, wonderful. oh, when people want to follow, uh, follow you on, I'll be, I'll share your, uh, website, Twitter, Facebook, Thank and Instagram, you. but, um, what do I just tell them what your handle is? Uh, in almost all places, it's the seated view, uh, except on Facebook where it's, it's, where I didn't think Lean, so I didn't Lena Anderson it. writer yeah yes yeah. and my name is spelled with all, almost all these yeah <laughs> oh yeah Anderson that's perfect yeah, yeah. And a lot of people when they, if they get my name spelled right they'll just go oh Anderson that's S-O-N no it's not just yeah. S-O-N <clears throat> yes yes well thank you so much and um I look forward to hearing people's feedback I think this is such an important topic and it's one that's a uh, gonna come up again and again so thank you again thank you thank you for having me